Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the Holocaust Center for Humanities Lunch and Learn program. I'm Alana Cohn Kennedy, the Holocaust Center's Director of Education. I want to thank our many community partners for their support of today's program. The Henry M. Jackson Foundation, the Ray Walpole Institute for the Study of the Holocaust, Genocide, and Crimes Against Humanity at Western Washington University, Washington State University History Department, the Humanities Alliance at Everett Community College, Temple B'nai Torah, Temple Hirsch Sinai, Temple Beth Shalom, J Connect Seattle, and the Moshe House Seattle. Thank you. In 1736, Benjamin Franklin wrote, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Our news today is dominated by the race for a vaccine for COVID-19. At no time in our recent history have we felt the critical need for prevention more astutely. Once we have a vaccine, I've lost count of the number of times I have heard this phrase just in the last week. Once we have a vaccine, once we can prevent this disease from destroying our bodies and economies, we can stop the suffering before it begins. Prevention is the golden ticket to saving lives. According to the Early Warning Project, there are more than 30 countries at high risk for genocide, and 13 of them are currently experiencing ongoing mass killing. As economies and countries weaken due to the pandemic, as materials and resources become scarce, populations at risk of genocide face an even greater threat from their oppressors. After the Holocaust, the world chanted, never again. We have failed each other as we have witnessed genocide again and again in the decades after the Holocaust. This is not an excuse to throw our hands in the air as if genocide is inevitable to the human condition. As Dr. James Waller describes in his writing, genocide is a human problem and as such has a human solution. We can undo a problem that we have created. If anything, never again means we will never again turn, to bl turn a blind eye. Never again will we discount entire populations of human beings as being expendable. Never again will we wait for a full-blown genocide before we try and stop it. When we say never again, we reaffirm our commitment to learn from the tragedy of the Holocaust and to take responsibility. We take responsibility for trying to prevent genocide before it starts. At the Holocaust Center for Humanity, our educational resources and lessons challenge students to stand up, to see individuals behind the statistics, to speak out, and to hold our elected officials accountable. Above all, the programs and resources at the Holocaust Center for Humanity impart the message that each one of us has the power to make a difference. One of the books that we include in our recommended teaching materials for upper high school and college students is Becoming Evil, How Ordinary People Commit Genocide and Mass Murder by Dr. James Waller. I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Waller over 15 years ago when he was living in Washington State. Over the years, he has graciously answered my countless questions about genocides past and present. He has spoken at our programs and has provided feedback on our new resources. No longer living in Washington, Dr. James Waller is the Cohen Professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Keene State College in New Hampshire. Dr. Waller also works as the Director of Academic Programs for the Auschwitz Institute for Peace and Reconciliation, an international non-governmental organization devoted to genocide and mass atrocity prevention. In addition to four books, he has published 28 articles in peer-reviewed professional journals and contributed 20 chapters in edited books. In addition to his regular Psychology Today blog, he is frequently interviewed by broadcast and print media, including PBS, CNN, CBC, The Los Angeles Times, The Washington Post, and The New York Times. Dr. Waller will answer questions at the end of the program. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to type in your questions at any time. We will address as many as we can at the end. Thank you all again for joining us today for this important program. We couldn't offer programs like this one without our supporters. If you are able, please consider making a donation on our website, holocaustcenterseattle.org. Just click the donate button in the top, right of the, the top right corner of the homepage. Thank you for your support. Dr. James Waller, thank you for all of your collaboration over the years. It is an honor to have you with us today, and I will turn it over to you. 
Thank you, Alana, for the kind introduction. And hello, everyone. I feel like I start off saying this a lot now, but I miss seeing everyone. I miss being face to face. It's a great privilege to be with you here today. And I'm certainly looking forward to that next time we can be together in person. As Alana said, it's been close to 20 years that I've been working in some sort of capacity with the Holocaust Center for Humanity, and it's been wonderful to see the growth of its programming and its new museum and all the incredible work that Alana and the rest of the st staff are doing there as well. So it's a great opportunity for me to join you today via this webinar here from a very sunny New England. This is that time of year for us where the weather can't make up its mind if it wants to be spring or summer, but we're definitely, definitely veering towards summer today as it's pretty warm outside. Again, I hope everyone is staying safe and well, and I very much appreciate you taking the time to be with us today and taking the time to support the work of the Holocaust Center for Humanity as well. Um, as Alana mentioned, I come today wearing two professional hats. One is I'm the Cohen Professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Keene State College here in Keene, New Hampshire. I've just completed my 10th year here at the college. Uh, Keene State is proud to be home to the only undergraduate major and minor program in Holocaust and Genocide Studies in the U.S. So we draw students, even though we're a regional public liberal arts institution, we draw students from around the country who come to us uh, for the specific uh, study that we offer in Holocaust and Genocide Studies in our major program. The other hat that I've worn now for about the past 13 years is, as Alana said, Director of Academic Programs for the Auschwitz Institute for the Prevention of Genocide and Mass Atrocities. We've just changed our name as of this January 1st. This is an international non-governmental organization devoted to the prevention of genocide mass atrocities, what we'll be speaking about today. The Auschwitz Institute has offices in New York City, Buenos Aires, Argentina, Kampala, Uganda, and also in Austria and Poland. Our work is specifically targeted at government officials, uh, security sector, military, police force personnel, people who are at the front lines of trying to ensure that never again becomes a reality, but for whom there really hadn't been any targeted programming until we started our work now 13 years ago. Our work involves face-to-face -face seminars and online training for government and security sector personnel on issues related to atrocity prevention. To date, we have trained over 5,500 government and security sector personnel from today, more than 88 countries around the world. So we have a global reach in this programming. And part of what I wanna speak with you about today is an outgrowth of something I developed uh, several weeks ago when the pandemic broke. At the Auschwitz Institute, we began to look at the situation and recognized that this pandemic was going to be pose significant additional challenges for our work in atrocity prevention. One of the partners we work with is the United Nations. And for many years, colleagues at the UN offices have been saying to us, the thing that keeps them awake at night in terms of global stability is a pandemic, that that's what they worried about. And when this pandemic broke in early March, globally, we recognized right away that this was gonna have significant implications for our work in atrocity prevention. For me, I think part of what I've been concerned about, and certainly part of what we're concerned about in atrocity prevention, is that what the pan pandemic has done, and I, and I say this as much to me as to anyone else, is it has made us rather self-absorbed. It has turned our focus inward. We wanted to protect ourselves. We wanted to protect our family. We wanted to protect people close to us. We worried about the mechanics and the basics of face mask, of toilet paper, of food, of personal safety. And my worry has been that whenever we become that self-absorbed by something like a pandemic, it means that we are looking at ourselves far more than we're looking at others, that we're looking at protecting ourselves far more than we are looking at protecting others. So I wanna to start uh, today my presentation and I'll share the PowerPoint with you here by looking specifically at this quote from psychologist Daniel 
Goldman, who says, self-absorption in all its form, forms kills empathy, let alone compassion. When we focus on ourselves, our world contracts as our problems and preoccupations loom larger, but when we focus on others, our world expands. Our own problems drift to the periphery of the mind and so seem smaller, and we increase our capacity for connection, our compassionate action. And I think really the charge that I wanna give us today, and I include myself in that, is a charge to, to remember that our world has contracted because of this pandemic. Our worlds have become incredibly small. And for many of us, our worlds have now literally become the homes in which we live. But in the work of atrocity prevention, when that type of contraction and self-absorption happens, vulnerable populations around the world are put at increasing risk. And so our challenge is, can we increase that capacity for, for connection? Can we remember what it's like to be connected to, to others? And can we remember about the importance of protecting our most vulnerable populations from mass atrocity? So the three focus questions I want to uh, work on in our time together are these. One, what do we mean by atrocity prevention? Secondly, what are the risk factors, accelerants, and triggers for atrocities? And thirdly, what are the implications of pandemics, and specifically COVID-19, for atrocity prevention? Where does it make our work more challenging, and at the same time, make our work even more urgent? So I'll start first with the question of what do we mean by atrocity prevention? In the field of atrocity prevention, we are talking about preventing the three internationally recognized crimes of mass atrocity, which are war crimes, which have been around for centuries, crimes against humanity, which is a early 20th century uh, invention, and then thirdly, the crime of genocide, which dates from 1948. And those three crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity, the crime of genocide, are what we refer to as an umbrella term crimes of mass atrocity. Many, many times you'll hear the term ethnic cleansing put in there. Ethnic cleansing is not an internationally recognized crime. No one's ever been convicted for it. No one's ever going to be brought to justice for it. Whatever people mean by ethnic cleansing, which is typically forced population displacement, we already have that covered as a crime against humanity. So when we think about atrocity prevention, we're thinking about preventing war crimes, crimes against humanity, and the crime of genocide, all internationally recognized crimes. When we think about atrocity prevention in that regard, we think about three phases of prevention. I think early on, 20 years ago, as atrocity prevention was becoming its own subfield within genocide studies, when people spoke of atrocity prevention, and this still often happens today, what they're speaking of, what they're thinking of their mind is, military intervention. That the way you prevent atrocities is once the killing starts, you put boots on the ground, you respond to the force of killing with greater force, and that's what atrocity prevention is. If there's one thing I want you to take away from our time together today, it, it is this. That is an incredibly, incredibly limiting conception of atrocity prevention and a dangerously limiting conception. When we think of atrocity prevention, we think of it at all phases of the conflict cycle. So primary prevention is the most important. It's upstream. What do we do before conflict breaks out? How do we analyze risk? What are the warning signs we look for? Secondly, is midstream prevention. Once conflict breaks out, what do we do to stop the conflict? What do we do to slow it down? What do we do to try to mitigate atrocities? And then thirdly, is downstream prevention. When it's over, we can't look the other way. We have to do the hard work of fostering resiliency in post-atrocity societies. Now you can think of these three forms of prevention like you might think about preventing heart disease. How do we go about preventing heart disease? Primary prevention is we understand risk factors, weight, smoking, lack of exercise, genetic factors, and where we can, we address those risk factors. 
But let's say we are not successful in addressing all the risk factors and we have a stroke, we have a heart attack, we have some significant episode of heart disease. We don't throw our hands up and stop at that point. We still try to prevent the loss of life. It's more expensive. It's more dangerous once it's got to that point, but we're still trying to prevent. Let's say we save the life. What do we do? We try to foster a resilient system of eating, of exercise, of healthy living, so that the person doesn't fall back into that crisis. This is what we're doing in atrocity prevention. How do we build strong societies before anything happens? If something happens, how do we slow down the killing? How do we stop the killing? And then finally, once the killing is over, how do we rebuild a society? So perhaps it's stronger than before. And that's so important because we know that the single greatest risk factor for genocide is this. Has a country had a genocide in its recent past, 45 to 50 years? If they have, that puts them at increased susceptibility and risk to the recurrence of genocide in the future. And very often that's because we haven't taken the time and the concern to rebuild a society after the killing is over. So today, for instance, we're looking at two post-genocide societies in Rwanda and Bosnia-Herzegovina, both of which many scholars would say are at very heightened risk for the return of atrocities because of the ways in which their societies have been rebuilt, or in the case of Bosnia-Herzegovina, have not been rebuilt to try to, to develop this sense of resiliency. So when we're talking about prevention, it's very important to understand we're always preventing. Before conflict, during conflict, after conflict, we're always doing the hard work of prevention. So let's talk then about the second question, which is what are the risk factors, accelerants, and triggers? Risk factors are that primary prevention I've talked about. What are the stacks of wood in a country that give us clues about to what degree that country's at risk for atrocity. Again, 20 years ago, we would have said, we, we have very little literature on this. Today, we have a wealth of literature that gives us a clear understanding of what the risk factors are. If anyone ever says to you about a case of genocide today, Myanmar, South Sudan, Congo, wherever it is, and they say to you, wow, we didn't see that coming. They simply mean they didn't look at it. If they had looked at it, we know what risk looks like. We know what puts a country at risk for this type of violence. Very generally speaking, uh, in my work, I focused on four categories of risk factors for atrocities. One is governance. By this, I simply mean, how does the governance system of a country work? Does it have a lot of corruption? Is there unequal access to power? Is power shared in a way that, that puts in concrete identity and leaves out other identities? So for instance, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, to be president, you can be Bosniak, Croat, or Serb, but if you're a Jew or Roma, you could never be president. The system, the peace settlement is not set up to allow those minority groups to have full participation in governance. So there are governance risk factors we're concerned about. There are risk factors related to conflict history that we're concerned about. And this is very relevant to the work Elena does with teachers and the, and the education programming. How is conflict history taught? How is memory processed? How is memory understood in a post-genocidal society? Again, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, Bosniaks, Serbs, Croats learn their histories from three different textbooks. And in each of the three textbooks, they were the victims. They were the people attacked. How we remember conflict in our country, how we think about the Civil War, how we teach the Civil War, how we think about indigenous peoples, how we teach about the removal and the extermination of indigenous peoples. All of those things can be taught in healthy ways that reduce 
the risk of conflict history. And they can also be taught in, in biased, uh, poor ways that increase the risk conflict history poses. Economic conditions are a big factor that we're seeing increasing attention paid to. What do we know about what are called horizontal inequalities? Differences, economic discrimination between groups of people simply based on identity. We know that that puts a society in a very unstable, fragile state. And then finally, and perhaps most important, is social fragmentation. What is the role of identity in a society? How much does identity matter? How is identity defined? How, does, how is identity related to power and resources, resource distribution, resource accumulation? How fragmented is a society? Uh, the book I'm finishing now, hopefully within the next week, uh, the new book coming out from Oxford is a book titled A Troubled Sleep, Risk and Resilience in Contemporary Northern Ireland. I spent a sabbatical semester as an honorary visiting research professor at Queen's University in Belfast three years ago. And during that time when I would speak to college students at Queen's University, the most prestigious university in Northern Ireland, one of my first questions typically was, when was the first time you met someone from the other side? Meaning, if you're Protestant, when's the first time you met a Catholic? If you're Catholic, when's the first time you met a Protestant? And regardless of, of the class I taught, 95% of students easily said, the first time I met someone from the other side was when I came to university. 18, 19 years of their life spent in complete social segregation and isolation from the other side, from people who believe differently, from people who had a different interpretation of conflict history. So we can look at, and in, in my book, Confronting Evil, I look at all the factors in these four categories to understand where do we have the greatest evidence for? How, what puts a country at risk? And we know the risk factors now. We should never again be surprised when atrocities break out because we know where the stacks, the, we know how the wood is stacked. We know what pieces of wood represent the risk and we can see those accumulations of risk as we look at a country's current status. If we think of the risk factors as wood, we can then think of accelerants as the things that are thrown on that wood, the petrol, the gasoline, that is added to the wood that just increases the risk. So again, here we worry about societies where there's a lot of wood stacked because of a lot of risk. And then we worry about societies where accelerants are being thrown on that wood. Examples of accelerants that we could look at, some of those are internal to the state. When there are regime transitions, when the state is going into uh, increasing isolationism, when there are failed peace agreements, 54% of peace agreements fail within five years of signatures. So the majority of them fail. When those type of things happen, that can accelerate some of the risk in a society. Sometimes accelerants are external to the state. Things like military intervention in the affairs of a state would be an external accelerant. When refugees move, we have more refugees in the world today than at any point in recorded human history. Millions of people who cannot live in their home, most often because they're insecure in their home, they are afraid of being victims of conflict, and they're either internally displaced in their own country, or they're actual refugees who have fled to another country. Many of those in the world today still fleeing from the conflict in Syria. So these are massive population movements that again just accelerate the fragility of states. When people leave and people flee uh, violence in South Sudan, they go to neighboring countries that are little more stable than South Sudan is. And when they go to those countries, that flood of refugees absolutely is something that can accelerate risk. One of the big accelerants we're looking at today is climate change. Uh, climate change is something that contributes to the, to the movement of populations. As sea levels rise, people who live near the sea have to move inland. As they move inland, there are already people inland. 
and that often leads to tension. Uh, climate change leads to desertification of environments that once may have been uh, habitable that now become increasingly inhabitable. So all of these things are things that are fuel to the risk that we can see in societies. And then after the accelerants, we worry about the triggers. So right now, as I said, we can look at any of the 194 countries in the world and we can see where the wood is stacked. We can look at the accelerants. We can see places where that wood is being doused in gasoline. What is harder to see sometimes are the triggers. These things are very often unforeseen. Sometimes we see them coming, but many times we don't. And those triggers are the matches that set this wood afire. Triggering factors that open windows of atrocity risk could be a wide range of things. Natural disasters, terrorist attacks, political assassinations. April 6, 1994, the Rwandan genocide where 100,000 people were slaughtered, I'm sorry, 800,000 people slaughtered over the course of a 100-day period. That's a rate of killing that is a frenzy. We had never seen anything like 800,000 people killed in 100 days. It was triggered with the planned assassination of a president, Yuvenal Hapiarimana, who was returning from a peace conference in Arusha, Tanzania. Epidemics, anniversaries, commemorations, and you'll see here in the middle of the list, pandemics. Pandemics are a trigger that we haven't had to deal with in recent history. And so they've always been that theoretical trigger that's out there. But as I said in the beginning, they've been the trigger that has kept a lot of people in the field up at night worrying because they knew if a true pandemic broke out, in other words, something that had a global effect, not just national, not just regional, but a global impact, they knew that that impact would be felt by the world's most vulnerable populations. And it is being felt by the world's most vulnerable populations. So that leads us to our third question, is then what are the implications of COVID-19 for risk factors, for some of the things we talked about as a trigger for the possible commission of atrocities? And I'm not gonna look here at conflict history. I'm gonna look at the three more relevant cases or issues of governance, economic conditions, and the impact on social fragmentation. Firstly, in terms of the implications of COVID-19 for governance, is that certainly, as, we, as I've been saying, the implications are greatest for vulnerable and high-risk populations. These are populations that governments already have had difficult times, many times, protecting and attending to, and now they're populations that have become even greater risk. Many times vulnerable and high-risk populations, and I include here refugees and internally displaced persons, many of these are people who already have compromised health status, who already personally are at risk of something like a pandemic running through their communities and already have compromised health status. There are communities where social distancing is not possible in many cases. Most of us have had the luxury of being able to socially distance by returning to our homes, having a good amount of square footage to ourselves, living in communities with relatively low population density, as I do here in, in a small town in New Hampshire. Uh, our population density is incredibly low. All of those things are things that are protective. For refugees, vulnerable, high-risk, internally displaced people, they don't have those same options. Social distancing is not an option in a refugee camp. Social distancing is not an option in many of the urban settings where some of the highest risk individuals live. So the very things that we're relying on to protect ourselves during this time period of the pandemic, many of the world's most vulnerable populations simply do not have that option. And we see this sometimes even in our own country's discussions about um, you know, choosing to stay at home, we're safer at home, we can work from home. And that, is, that works very well for the elite in our country. But there are many people in our country who simply don't have that option. 
to put food on the table, they don't have the option of working from home, of distancing themselves, of leaving their home in the city to go to another home in the countryside. That's just not options for most of the people in the world. We worry about zones of conflict where uh, people are caught in the vice of conflict. They're trying to leave a home country because they're at risk of their life if they choose to stay there, and they're trying to flee to another country, and now that other country has closed its border. So here we have large populations caught in the vice of conflict, running from one country where they no longer feel safe, often because they're targets of their government, and then trying to go to another country for sanctuary, and that country having shut the doors. Where do these people go? Where do they find themselves? I mean, they live in fear of their lives before a pandemic. But once a pandemic has broken out, you start to see the, the weight here on governance to respond to these communities. And then finally, we see as a result of the pandemic, political leaders around the world, scapegoating opponents, stigmatizing opponents, stigmatizing marginalized populations, and this continues a very worrying trend for us, which has to do with the death of democracy. In 1989, many of you recognize this image. This is from November 1989, with the opening of the Berlin Wall between uh, East Berlin and West Berlin and in what is now Germany. Uh, I was teaching and living at the time in Berlin. I always feel like at this point I should should stop and point out, I'm not taking credit for the fall of the Berlin Wall by saying that, I'm simply saying I was there. If you wanna connect the dots and somehow give me credit, that's fine, but no credit is needed. I just happened to be in Berlin when the wall was coming down. We saw this, the world saw this as the beginning of a new era, that democracy was going to flourish. And indeed, for the next decade or so after 1989, democracy around the world flourished. As the Cold War died, authoritarian dictatorial regimes stepped back, democratic regimes stepped in. In the early 2000s though, that trend began to slowly reverse. And here you see an image from Freedom House about the global erosion of democratic norms over the past 15 years or so. We've seen it in country after country after country around the world. Limits on freedom of expression, limits on the rights of migrants, uh, some episodes of what Freedom House calls ethnic cleansings, uh, electoral processes declining, open elections declining. I worked with one country uh, that I won't mention a few years ago as an election monitor. And the country had a, a very difficult history uh, of election and election fraud. And I was there on the ground and the elections were going on. And when the elections were over, uh, the leaders of the country were just thrilled. And they, could, they just loved telling everyone, we had incredible turnout for our election. We had 140% turnout. And we had to explain to them that 140% turnout is not good in an election. Something was wrong, something was flawed. More people voted more than once than should have voted. So we've seen for the past 15 years around the world, the global erosion of these type of democratic norms. Here you see in 2018, The Economist puts out every year a democracy index. And here you see the index from 2018. Full democracies are in the darker shades of green. Uh, you see relatively few of those around the world, Scandinavian countries, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, really working well as full democracies. Most of what you see are flawed democracies, hybrid regimes, and authoritarian regimes. Closest to home, the US was a flawed democracy in the 2018 index. That was the first time since The Economist had published this index that the US was listed as anything but a full democracy. So this retreat from democracy had already been happening. What has now happened with the pandemic is that it's given authoritarian leaders even more reason and more license to pull back from democracy. 
We've seen it, for instance, in Hungary, the type of democratic backsliding for leaders prone to authoritarian, authoritarianism are using the pandemic for their own political and social purposes to even move further away from any pretense of democracy out of concern for quote unquote public safety or public health. Evan Osnos wrote in December 2016, what's that precise moment in the life of a country when tyranny takes hold? It rarely happens in an instant, it arrives like twilight and at first the eyes adjust. And I think for several years we've seen this around the world that democracy doesn't go away overnight. But what happens is it's like twilight. It gets a little darker, a little darker, a little darker. You don't notice, you don't notice. And then at some point it's dark and you realize it's gone. It's been, it's dark. There's been a full eclipse. The pandemic in many countries around the world has sped that up now because again, leaders who already trend toward and tend toward authoritarian leanings, even some dictatorial leanings, now have greater permission to do that under the guise of a public health crisis response. And our concern will be in terms of prevention when this is over, how can we get these countries back to some semblance of democracy? How can democracy again win the day the way it was winning the day after 1989? There are also implications of COVID-19 for economic conditions. Certainly we see uh, a global recession and depression. Um, I don't think any longer, uh, you know, I think at the beginning of this, people were hoping for uh, at best, a, a, at worst, a recession. I think most people around the world today, uh, economists look at it and say, this is gonna be a depression and it's not going to hit all countries equally and it's not going to hit all people equally. And because of that, the type of economic inequality that already plays, plagues the world and the type of economic inequality that already plagues our country is gonna be even more heightened. We worry about escalations in unemployment, particularly among young males in fragile countries. Uh, young males who do not have uh, access to employment uh, viable employment options. We know that it's not infrequent that they join gangs, militias, paramilitaries in fragile countries, that they become part of guerrilla warfare, often in trying to overthrow countries, or most often become part of criminal black market activities, including activities like human trafficking and enslavement. So the economic consequences of COVID-19 are going to lead to far less economic opportunities for people around the world. And we're very worried about what people will step into to try to find a future economically when they don't have the opportunities that are constructive, but may choose opportunities that are destructive. We also worry about unequal access to social services and healthcare. Again, we see this in our own country, but it certainly is exacerbated in other fragile countries around the world as well, that the people who most need, the most vulnerable people who need social services, who need healthcare, are the ones having the hardest time finding it. Again, to bring this closer to home, you don't have to think about this as an African issue or an Eastern European issue or a Latin American issue. You can look in our country at the Navajo Nation which is, is being devastated, decimated by COVID-19, uh, both in terms of economic issues and the other issues we're talking about as well, but who haven't had the access to social services and healthcare that many of the rest of us enjoy. And then finally, I do think there are implications of COVID-19 as well for social fragmentation. Here you see on the uh, slide a picture of a wall. This is a peace wall in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Uh, Belfast has more, uh, Northern Ireland has more peace walls than any country in the world today. Uh, rather than being taken down, there being more of them are being put up and more of them, as you can see in this image, are being built higher and higher and higher. That type of visible social fragmentation, we certainly see in countries around the world, but there's also an, in, an invisible, 
apartheid, a less visible social fragmentation that also is important. COVID-19 and its implications are gonna be disproportionately impactful uh, for poor elderly and children. Again, when we say social distancing, that has a very different meaning for most of us compared to those of us who, who are poor, those of us who are elderly, uh, children, especially poor children, this is gonna have very differential impacts on. And we've seen many of those effects even in our own country. There certainly is an unequal access to technology. Uh, my college, Keene State, like all universities around the country, uh, effectively shut down face-to-face -face learning uh, at the height of the pandemic and went to remote learning. We did the best we could in an emergency situation as faculty. Our students had to fight upstream on this. Many of them live in rural areas of New England that simply don't have the the bandwidth to be able to do the type of learning that we were forced into doing for remote learning. So not all of us have the same access to technology as the rest of us. Certainly there's polarization by political, social, media, and religious leaders. As I said at the beginning, um, pain makes us narcissistic and the pandemic has made us narcissistic and self-absorbed. We want to protect us, and we want to protect ours. And anytime we start thinking about us and ours, we begin thinking about them and theirs. And we don't want thems here. And this is particularly relevant with foreigners. And we've seen our country uh, shut down on immigration issues. Again, some of that viable public health options and concerns. But what we worry about is what when those what happens when those public health issues become politicized and now they become convenient vehicles to bring in your political judgments about who we want to come here and more importantly who we don't want to come here who we don't want to be part of us and then finally there certainly are issues of gender-based violence and lack of physical physical security for women this remains a problem worldwide, and, and you don't need me to remind you of that. I think you're all well aware of it. But we knew early on that one of the things that social distancing and stay-at-home orders would do is it would force women and children into some very unsafe stay-at-home uh, situations. And in truth, country after country after country Global uh, gender-based violence, domestic abuse, domestic assault has increased, and an increase in sometimes in very dramatic ways. Uh, I've just I'm spending most of my time now in Northern Ireland, and the police service in Northern Ireland has just released data related to domestic abuse incidents uh, since the stay-at-home orders were put into place, and it's four times what it was last year at this time. I think most countries have similar types of trends that they're seeing. So we have significant concerns. We always have significant concerns about the physical, physical security of women and children in zones of conflict. They're the ones most at risk. I worked often at, at, at the Auschwitz Institute with police and security sector personnel, and they'll tell us straight out that in wars and zones of conflict, the safest person you can be is a military person uh, to be police. They're the safest ones. The ones that are most at risk are women and children. So we always worry about that physical security, but those worries have gone up quite a bit because of the uh, forced isolation now of women and children in situations that could be very unsafe. So in conclusion, and then we'll take questions, I want to finish with three slides. And this is my general conclusion, which is right now, it's very tempting to say that attention and funding has to solely be directed toward the pandemic. And I know, I know, I know that's where a lot of our attention and funding has to go. But it is not the time to turn attention and funding away from the work of atrocity prevention, including the work of the Holocaust Center for Humanity. That work is needed now more than it's ever been needed because civilians are at greater risk than we've seen in recent history. If we don't attend to that, this could be an escalation process that can lead to mass atrocities. 
with pandemic being the trigger. So our work of atrocity prevention is not something we do simply when we have the time to do it and when nothing else is going on in life. Right now, that work of atrocity prevention is absolutely more important than it's ever been. We have people coming to us at the Auschwitz Institute from around the world begging us to continue to do the work that we've done in their communities and in their countries because they recognize how vital this is right now. I'll close with two quotes. This is from Vaclav Havel. And he reminded us of the importance of human rights as universal and indivisible. Human freedom, also indivisible. If it's denied to anyone in the world, it is therefore denied indirectly to all people. This is similar to Martin Luther King Jr.'s refrain that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And this is why we can't remain silent because silence merely encourages them. Right now, we're in periods of enforced silence. We're protecting us, we're protecting ours, we're focused on ourselves, but in that silence, risk can multiply, accelerants can multiply, triggers can happen that can lead to the loss of thousands and thousands and thousands of lives. Then I'll close with this. This is a quote from Zaman Grakowski. Uh, when I teach our seminars in, in Poland, we teach in partnership with the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum. So I work closely with the museum several times a year. And if you visited uh, the Auschwitz concentration camp, Auschwitz I, and you've gone into Israel's exhibit in one of the former barracks, this is the quote you see as soon as you walk into the exhibit. It's from Zaman Grykowski, who came, he was a Jew, he came from the border of Lithuania and Poland, present-day Belarus. Uh, he was a member of the Sonder Commando, which, as most of you know, were the people who were picked for the gruesome work, sentenced to the gruesome work of uh, surviving. But the work meant that they cleaned out the crematoria, they cleaned out the grass chambers, they did the dirty work of killing that the Nazis didn't want to do, many times pulling their own family members out of the gas chambers uh, for cremation. Grykowski was a member of the revolt uh, on October 7th, 1944. Years later, a portion of his diary was found and in his diary he wrote this. Come here, you free citizen of the world whose life is safeguarded by human morality and whose existence is guaranteed through law. I want to tell you how modern criminals and despicable murderers have trampled the morality of life and nullified the postulates of existence. And what Grykowski is reminding us of is he's saying, what, what makes us feel safe in the world is a belief in basic human morality and a belief in the rule of law. Not all of us get that safety. Many African Americans in the US will say, the rule of law is not there for me the way it is for other people. But for many of us, it's that belief in basic morality and a belief in the rule of law that allows us to enter out into the world safely. What the pandemic has done is it has a tendency to narrow that conception of morality, to narrow the conception of the rule of law. And so I wanna close with this quote because Grykowski reminds us, come here. Let me show you Auschwitz-Birkenau. Let me show you what happens when we don't uphold human morality, when we don't uphold the rule of law and apply those to everyone. This is what it can end up as. So our responsibility today, my responsibility is to, today, is to recognize that as, as much as this pandemic makes us look inward, it is also the time to be looking outward because many of the world's most vulnerable populations need us today more than they ever have. All right, I'm gonna stop the sharing now and I believe we have uh, time for questions that Elena is going to give me and she promised to only give me the easiest one. So I'll look forward to those. Thank you very much. Great, I can't promise you're gonna get the easy ones seeing the list of questions right. that are coming in here. Um, but we have some really thoughtful and thought-provoking questions. Um, the first one comes from Professor Raymond Sun, and he says, 
I worry about the potential for widespread hostility against Asians in the United States due to fear and blaming going on in the current climate. There's a deep history of discrimination against Asians and recent events have shown ongoing prejudices reaching up to the highest levels of government. What preventative steps should we take to prevent mass targeting of Asians? Uh, thank you, Raymond. It is uh, good to hear from you, friend. It's been a while since we've uh, been together at Washington State, but I hope all is going well for you. Uh, your question is a wonderful question. The only thing I'd quarrel with on it is potential. Uh, it, this is not potential. This is happening. There is hostility being directed against Asians in the U.S. Uh, part of that is, is uh, misattributed victim blaming but certainly the fear that that could become widespread. This is something we talk about as an escalatory process. When we start to see a group of people targeted, and targeting very, very seldom has a realistic reason for it. It is most often these type of misattributions and mischaracterizations. But as people are targeted, when that is not checked, if it's left unchecked, that targeting can expand and expand and expand. And, and we've seen it with the, the history of an internment of Japanese Americans during World War II in our country as well. So your question, the important one is what we can do about it. And I think what I've always said to my students is that no voice is ever too small. You don't have to wait till you have your college degree. You don't have to wait till you get a PhD or whatever. At any point in the day, there are probably several points where all of us can do something, something to check this type of racism, this type, type of stereotyping, this type of victim blaming. That is so much more important today when we see our highest political leaders, religious leaders, social leader, leaders, leaders in media, not being willing to do so, and if anything, fanning the flames of those type of accusations. So I think, I hope, I think we've got about 150 people on here. I hope today we find 150 ways to shut down those type of statements, those type of beliefs, those type of reactions, however minor they are, it is going to be an important part of checking that process because what our history has shown us is we can't believe in American exceptionalism here. If we don't check these things, it will lead to widespread hostility, could lead to widespread violence, certainly could lead to widespread loss of civil rights. This is not a, it's not a hypothetical. We've been down the road. And we have to learn the lessons from having gone down that road. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you. Um, this next question comes from Braden, and he says, Dr. Waller, I am a senior at Seattle University, and we're studying your book, Becoming Evil, in my class on genocide, so it's a pleasure to hear you speak. Given what you've talked about today, I'm curious on your thoughts on COVID-19 in India, and specifically how it might affect the Muslims of the Assam state and Modi's government's attempts to write them out of their citizenship. Do you observe any accelerants or triggers in this case? Oh, thank you, Braden. That's a great question. And uh, I, I hope you're enjoying this last year at Seattle University. I know it's a, a difficult uh, time. I have a son who's in his senior year at University of New Hampshire, and I know how difficult the time is. Um, I think your question about India is spot on. Absolutely what is happening is Modi, as you have said, is using the pandemic as cover to try to wipe, uh, wipe out the identity of people, and we see this happening in Burma as well. So it's exactly an illustration of what I talked about earlier, that regimes that already tend toward or lean toward authoritarianism now have a perfect cover to do some of the types of things that would have been, they could have expected international resistance for before, but today they're able to say, no, this is just a consequence of responding to a public health crisis. And I absolutely think what's happening in India, as well as Myanmar, are examples of, of leadership exactly doing that. And this is where we have relied on um, the United Nations to step forward and be that kind of international voice. And I'm gonna keep coming back to our role in the US 
we've been part of that international movement, but the more isolationist we become, the less strength the United Nations has. And I hear this from, country, from people we work with in countries around the world, even if they don't like America, they know how important it is that America is involved at this international level. And they live in fear that we become so isolationist that there's no strength left to respond exactly to the type of crisis you've described in India. Thank you, Braden. Thank you. Um, this one comes from an anonymous attendee. And the question is, how do we go about turning the attention on a global scale toward atrocity prevention, particularly from our own institutional leaders in North America? Do you have recommendations on how the media can be leveraged? Uh, thank you, that's a great question. Um, a lot of the work we do at the Amish Institute is with U.S. government at different levels. Um, I work just in a private capacity. I teach at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center a couple times each year, working with ICE agents, Homeland Security, on these type of issues related to atrocity prevention. Um, we have made great progress as a country in understanding atrocity prevention should be a foreign policy initiative for us. Under President Obama, we put into place the Atrocity Prevention Task Force, our Atrocity Prevention Board. The Atrocity Prevention Board is still in place, still has meetings. I'm part of a study group on which many members of the Atrocity Prevention Board said. Uh, it doesn't have a budget line. It's not funded. I'm honestly not sure the current administration know the, knows the board still exists. Uh, if they did, I think the board could be in danger of not existing, but it's very limited now in thinking about atrocity prevention as foreign policy. But what we also have tried to push is to say, it's great to think about atrocity prevention as foreign policy. What can we do out there? But we have to think about atrocity prevention as closer to home. What does it mean for domestic policy? And you have to understand we're a country founded on the twin evils of the extermination of one people, indigenous people, and the enslavement of Africans. That's what our country is founded on. It was, it's what it was built on. So for us to think about atrocity prevention as just an out there problem is, is disingenuous at best. We also have to understand it as a domestic policy issue. And even under President Obama, it was difficult to get the administration to think about it as a domestic issue. They were much more comfortable thinking about it as a foreign policy issue. Thank you. Um, this next question comes from Irene, and it reads, thank you, Professor Waller. Do you have any comment on the ways we can rethink, adapt our early warning systems in this time of COVID-19? Best regards from Columbia. Oh, Irina. Very good to hear from you as well. It's been a while since I've seen you, but thanks very much for the, uh, for the question. Yeah, I, many countries have developed early warning systems for atrocity prevention. And, and the Auschwitz Institute, we've been, that's one of the things we do is help build the capacity of a country to develop its own early warning systems because the, the best response to risk is always domestically. We don't want the UN or other countries to have to be stepping in. We want to strong domestic institutions. I think we've done good work with that for a lot of early warning systems around the world. The problem with the pandemic is that it just compresses the urgency of everything. So typically in early warning, we're looking at long-term trends and structural indicators. The pandemic is a trigger that just compresses everything and early warning systems don't respond well to those type of quick immediate triggers. So I'm afraid that what happens is some of the important attention that needs to be paid to the structural risk factors gets lost because we're urgently paying attention to the pandemic. And if we let the urgent crush out the important there, that's gonna be problematic for us longer term. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna actually pose this last, uh, this last question to you. Um, and I wanna read just a very short section of an article that you wrote um, that comes from Psychology Today. And you wrote in the article, 
As ubiquitous as genocide seems, it is a human problem and as such has a human solution. At its root, genocide happens because we choose to see a people rather than individual people, and then we choose to kill those people in large numbers and over an extended period of time. In the midst of that bad news, the good news is that we can make another choice. We can find constructive rather than destructive ways to live with our diverse social identities. This seems to imply to me that you feel hopeful and that there must be points along the way where you feel inspired and that fuel hope. Can you tell us about some of the moments, people, actions that keep you optimistic that, um, that we might be able to change this human problem? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I see one of the questions in from Clarice is a similar one about how do I not lose hope? And I get this question often because I spend, I, I mean, I've interviewed over 225 perpetrators of, of mass violence uh, around the world face to face. And I spend a lot of my time immersed in that type of evil. And I think many times, and I, I teach full time in it now, and many times people wonder about this issue of hope. If that's all I did, work with perpetrators, if all I did was describe and teach about atrocities, I, I couldn't still be doing it. I wouldn't still be doing it. I do what I do because of the hope I see in the people that we work with. Over 5,000 people we've trained at the Auschwitz Institute. Every one of those people are a point of hope. They are people that have gone back to their countries and done remarkable things in their governments to bring about a, a, a difference. I look at this today, we've, you know, 160 some people have been involved in, in this chat we've had. For me, that's 160 points of hope. I mean, I leave something like today and I'm so fired up because this 160 people care enough to come out and listen to this, to be part of the programming that you do week after week after week. So as you mentioned in the, in the piece you quoted, it's absolutely a human problem. We're doing this to each other. But the beauty of it is, if it's a human problem, there's also a human solution. And I'd say, Alana, every day of my professional career, I hear from someone, I meet someone, I talk to someone that shows me that incredible, beautiful ray of hope of people who are committed to making a difference. And some days feel darker than others, but I know that around the world, the numbers of people who are coming together to make a difference. And I think of friends in Rwanda who say, how do you eat an elephant? It's one bite at a time. And I think of the thousands of us who are taking one bite at a time to make never again a reality. And that's the hope for me. And, and I wanna thank everyone who logged into this and the discussion we had, because again, you've lifted my heart. You, you've given me that sense of hope. So thank you. Thank you so, so much, Jim, for this very thought provoking uh, presentation and for your inspirational words as well. Um, it's really a pleasure to have you with us today. And thank you to all the people who joined in um, to listen to this. I want to also take a moment to thank our incredible team at the Holocaust Center for Humanity that continues to help make all these programs possible. Um, including our virtual speakers bureau presentations, our book discussion groups, teacher training, uh, timely and relevant teaching materials, and so much more. Our executive director, Dee Simon, Nicole Bella, our director of development, and Richard Green, our museum and technology director, who is running the technical side of this show. Lori Rochelle Cohen with our leg legacy speakers program, our education team, Julia Thompson, Paul Regelbrug, and Rosa Campos, Amanda Davis, our Senior Operations and Engagement Officer in our development team, Sydney Dreitel, and Ellie Seleski, Katie Lawrence, our Administration Coordinator. Um, I hope you will all be able to join us next Tuesday at the same time for a very special program that will challenge you to ask yourself whether you are really news literate. Next week's program is Propaganda versus News and will feature John Silva, the Director of Education at the News Literacy Project, and Holocaust Center for Humanity docents Marcy Bloom and Carl Schutoff will take a deep dive into a few examples of propaganda during the Holocaust um, that are also part of the Holocaust Center for Humanities collection. 
So thank you again for joining us today for this program. Thank you again, Dr. Waller, and I hope to see you back here next week. And this concludes our program. Thank you all.